This video contains beeped curse words. It was recorded while sleep deprived. I was struggling to muster a coherent thought. Business as usual, basically. Hello, today we are gonna look at the topic of multi-level models. Hurrah! And these are kind of a form of the general linear model which you apply when you have hierarchical data. More on that in a minute. So we've seen this diagram loads and loads of times before. I'm not gonna dwell on it. All I want to do is to point out that yet again, as we have been for uh, many, many lectures now, we are still sat in the middle of this diagram. So we're looking at yet another variation on the general linear model. And in particular, how we can adapt the general linear model to deal with situations where we have hierarchical data. So by the end of uh, today's session, hopefully you'll have some idea what hierarchical data are, so what I mean when I say hierarchical data, and have a look at why that creates a complication for uh, the normal general linear model. It's not so much a complication, but more we would like to model um, the hierarchical structure of the data, and that isn't intrinsically done within the general linear model. We're gonna have a look at uh, what are known as fixed and random coefficients and uh, what the difference between them is and how we can apply them, again, to look at uh, kind of contextual effects in our model. We're gonna have a look at how we build these models using R and how we interpret the models as well. And as ever, there's an accompanying tutorial uh, which you can go through if you want to learn how to code this stuff in R or just come to the University of Sussex and I will teach you. So what do I mean by hierarchical data? Well, data structures are quite often hierarchical. So naturally occurring uh, data quite often has a kind of hierarchical structure to it. And this is a list of several examples of hierarchies. The one that's always kind of wheeled out in the literature is, so basically any anytime you ever learn about multi-level models, uh, I'd be absolutely amazed if at some point some of the person teaching you does not mention uh, children nested within classrooms. And so, you know, I don't want to buck the trend. So my first example is going to be children nested within classrooms. So if you do any kind of research with children in schools, then children are clustered into classrooms that are taught by different teachers in those classrooms. So there's a kind of natural hierarchical structure to the data in that if you are you know, making assessments on children, then, then sort of sitting above those children is another level of the data, which is the classroom that they are in. And we'll see why this potentially matters in a minute. So that's a classic example of children nested within classrooms. So children within classrooms, you would ex and who are taught by the same teacher, you would expect to maybe perform more similarly to each other than they will to children in, different in a different class who are taught by a different teacher. I'll elaborate on that in a bit. Um, when you have repeated measures designs, so this is where you might have multiple measures on the same participant. So for example, if you're measuring uh, their levels of depression, for example, over time, so you've got, uh, you know, you've got them to fill out a questionnaire at one month, two months, three months, four months, or whatever, then those observations are nested within the person. So again, there's a kind of hierarchical hierarchy there with the sort of scores at the lowest level and sitting above them is the individual who contributed those scores. Looking at say organizational psychology or business um, kind of studies, you have employees nested within organizations and in indeed you might have pe um, employees nested within teams within organizations. So again, we've got another kind of structure here. If you were interested in kind of researching say middle management or something, you might be looking at min middle management across different organizations. So again, you have a, a hierarchy there. The organizations kind of sit above the middle management. Uh, in more clinical kind of research or medical kind of research, you've got patients nested within hospitals. So again, if you were doing some kind of research on, um, I don't know, cancer treatments or something, um, you might collect data across uh, several units at different hospitals. So again, the hospital is um, kind of a level of the a level of the data that's kind of sitting above the observations. So you will have patients being treated at different hospitals in different parts of the country. Um, so the hospitals, uh, again, are kind of a context in which your treatment effects sit. 
And uh, you can have a three level hierarchy, patients nested within teams nested within hospitals. So uh, certain patients might have certain clinical teams, those clinical teams are nested within hospitals. So you've got kind of a couple of levels of the hierarchy there. Uh, in clinical psychology, service users nested within clinicians who are nested within hospitals, who might be nested within, in the UK, NHS trusts. So you can have you know, hierarchy after hierarchy after hierarchy after hierarchy. So if you're doing some kind of uh, trial on a treatment for anxiety, say, for example, you will, uh, people being treated for anxiety, they're being treated by different clinicians. So that's a first layer of the hierarchy because you'd expect the clinician that someone has who's treating them to possibly have an effect on whether the treatment is successful. Those clinicians are nested within hospitals, so certain clinicians will work within certain hospitals, and hospitals will be nested within certain kind of organisational structures or tr uh, trusts, as they're called in the UK. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, again, you can see that you've got this kind of increasing levels of hierarchy. And at any level of that hierarchy, you might expect the effects of the thing that you're interested in to be different. So the effect of your treatment on anxiety might be different depending on the clinician that's treating the person on the hospital that they're being treated in and within the NHS, NHS trust that they're being treated in. And to uh, give the example that we're gonna use in this lecture, we've got um, a sort of thinly veiled clinical example of, uh, not, of uh, zombies being rehabilitated. And again, this is a, kind of in a clinical setting, so different zombies have attended different clinics. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what we mean by hierarchical data structures. We're going to have a look in particular at a couple of examples and like I said staying with the tried, uh, tried and tested idea of uh, children within classrooms this is an example of a two level hierarchy so hopefully what you can see on this diagram is we have lots of individual children child one child two child three and so on and so forth right through to you know whoever the last child that we collect data from is over here each of those children sits in a different classroom. So this is, let's assume this is at one school and you know maybe they've got 20 classes or something. Uh, each child sits within a classroom. And those classes might be different sizes. So if you look at the number of children in each class, you can see the different sizes. Class two only has four children. That would never happen in the UK. Um, actually, the first one has eight in. That would, that would also never happen. Um, so, but anyway, the point is, you've got different numbers of children in different classrooms, so that you know they don't have to be matched or anything. But for each child, we have this kind of context of the class in which they're being taught. So the class acts as a it's a what's known as a level two um, variable. So it's it's sort of sitting at level two of the hierarchy, and at level one, the lowest level of the hierarchy, you've got the child. So this is one of the, you know, this is kind of what we mean. We can take this step further and add another level to the hierarchy. So we've got, you know, ostensibly the same kind of example here of children nested within classrooms. The only difference here is we've added level three to the hierarchy. So let's imagine that we, we're now collecting data across multiple schools. So then the school becomes another level to the hierarchy. So in our first school, we've got three classes, class one, two, and three, imaginatively labeled. And within each classroom, we've got different children. So for a particular child, the class acts as a context for the data that we're collecting, but also the school acts as a context for the data we're collecting as well. So this is a three level hierarchy. The participant is at the lowest level of the hierarchy, the classroom is at level two, school is at level three. Now, hopefully that makes some sort of sense, but why do we care? Well, why we care is that data from the same context is likely to be more similar than data from different contexts. So to uh, use the example of children within classrooms, children in the same class, if we're looking at say academic attainment, children in the same class will be more likely to perform similarly to other children in their class relative to how they would perform compared to a different class of children because Again, we'll get on to this in a bit more detail in a minute because you'd expect, for example, the teacher to have an effect. Similarly, if you look at people being treated in the same clinics, you know, a given clinic is going to have a certain kind of protocol, a certain kind of way of delivering a treatment, etc., etc., etc. So you might expect treatment responses to be more similar 
uh, within people that have been treated at the same clinic relative to uh, when you compare it to people who've been treated in different clinics. So essentially you've got dependency in the data, the context in potentially introduces dependency in the data and dependency in the data means that you get dependencies in the model errors. Now, if you think all the way back to the lecture on the beast of bias, we talked about an assumption of independence. So in the ordinary least squares general linear model, we have this assumption that uh, errors in the population model are independent. So we talked about spherical errors. So errors shouldn't be related to each other, essentially. When you have a hierarchical data structure, it becomes more likely that the model errors are in fact codependent in some way or another. So some, some, I mean, basically the errors attached to people within the same context are likely to be more related to each other so that than to uh, errors from people in different contexts. So you get a dependency there. So the, the errors in prediction for people in the same context are likely to be related to each other. We also know from that lecture on bias that when we don't have independent errors in our model, then we get bias standard errors and if we have bias standard errors then we get bias confidence intervals and also biased p-values. So hierarchies potentially matter because they bias standard errors, confidence intervals and p-values. Now let's try and put this uh, kind of a bit more concretely. Now I want you to imagine two classrooms of children and they are both learning statistics. Or, you know, maybe maths. I don't know. They're learning something like that. Now, the first class is taught by a teacher. And I grew up in the 70s in England, and there were some uh, kids' books called The Mr. Men uh, when I was growing up. They're still around now, actually. Um, and but, but it's one of those things that, like, when you're a kid and you, you kind of read and love these books, and then you sort of grow up and you buy them to read to your own children, and then you realise how, hor how horrendous they are and what bad values... Uh, they instill in everyone. Um, and that's the case with the Mr. Men. Essentially, the, the, the Mr. Men books are all about retribution. It's not good. Anyway, imagine, I digress, uh, imagine that one class is taught by Mr. Doubtful. Now, Mr. Doubtful, he did his teacher training and he's qualified in everything, but he's very anxious about maths and statistics. He doesn't feel very confident, even though he's got a teaching qualification. So he worries that he's going to get the answer wrong. As a side note, my maths teacher at school used to go through kind of uh, long proofs on the blackboard. Um, <laughs> Google a blackboard to find out what one of those was. Um, so um, yeah, he used to do all these long sort of proofs on the board and then he'd get to the end and go, and therefore the answer is 56 or whatever. And then um, someone in the class would like look up the answer in the back of the book and go, sir, sir, um, it's, uh, the answer is actually 63. And then he'd just, like scratch his head and turn around and look at all this like stuff he'd written out on the board and, and then start rubbing bits out that he'd got wrong. And you know, after about four attempts, he'd finally get round to uh, the correct answer, which could explain a lot about my mathematical ability, frankly. But anyway, um, so he's you know he's maybe a bit like that. He's had a few bad experiences. He feels very a bit anxious about teaching, a bit doubtful. He's not quite sure that uh, you know, he, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to maths. I can relate to this somewhat. Um, so what are his class going to be like, do you think? All these kind of anxieties he's had and maybe the errors that he makes, maybe he's going to transmit them onto his children, his, na uh, his children, his class of children. So um, it's possible that as well as teaching them the maths, he's also passing on anxieties about maths, his lack of confidence about maths. And in fact, because he's making mistakes, because he lacks confidence, maybe he's just not actually teaching them that well as well. So, you know, they're also confused because he keeps making mistakes when he's going through things. Um, so those children maybe end up being a bit like <coughs> about maths, a bit unconfident, a bit doubtful, like their teacher. Now, in a different classroom, along the corridor, we have Ms. Confident, who is very good at maths, knows that she's very good at maths, very confident about her ability in maths, and 
really happy to be teaching it. What's her class going to be like? Well, maybe they're going to be a lot more confident about their mathematical ability because as well as the fact that maybe she's making fewer mistakes, she might actually be kind of teaching them better. But she's also passing on a kind of a sense that, you know, math is nothing to be afraid of and, you know, you can do it because she herself is confident. So her confidence is coming across to her classroom and her pupils are, as well as perhaps getting taught better, are also uh, feeling more empowered to learn the, um, you know, to, to learn what she's teaching them. Now, I'm picking two sorts of extremes here, but you hopefully get the idea that the, the teacher or the classroom provides a context for how children learn. Of course, it's not just the teacher as well. Uh, you've got, you know, the dynamics of who's in the classroom. Are there, you know, disruptive children in one classroom and no disruptive children in another classroom? All that sort of thing. So the classroom provides potentially a powerful context to the children's learning. So if you're if you were looking at mathematical attainment and you were measuring it across those two classrooms and you just ignore the classrooms, then you're ignoring something very important in the data. The fact that in Mr. Doubtful's class, those children are likely to be more similar in how they perform mathematically because they've been taught by the same person. They've taken on the, potentially the values of that person and the doubts of that person. But also they may be just a bit more confused because that person is more confused when they're teaching them. Whereas if we look at Miss Confidence class, again, her classroom, the people within it are likely to perform more similarly because they've had, again, the same teacher who is more confident, perhaps more, has more clarity in what she's teaching and so on and so forth. So any differences between those two classrooms are not necessarily down to um, natural ability of the children, it's da also down to the context in which they've been taught. So hierarchies provide an important context and they also make uh, observations more related to each other. So the children in Mrs. Conf Ms. Confidence class, their scores should be more similar to each other than they would be to scores in, uh, say, Mr. Doubtful's class. And conversely, the, the scores in Mr. Doubtful's class should be more similar to each other than if you were to look at uh, a child in his class compared to a child in Miss Confidence class. So it's kind of creating a dependency in the scores. The context creates a dependency. Basically, we've got a problem with just fitting the kind of ordinary least squares linear model that we've been talking about up to now, because we, by having context that potentially create dependency in the scores, we also create dependency in the model errors. And that violates uh, the assumption of uh, spherical errors. But what we can do instead is fit something called a multi-level model. And this is where we essentially try to model these contextual effects. So what we're trying to do is model variability in the effects that we're interested in across these different contexts. And we can do this by modeling variability in the intercepts and variability in the slopes. I'm gonna explain what I mean by that in a minute. We can uh, develop models to model the violations of the assumption of spherical errors. So if we think our errors are not dependent anymore, we can actually model that explicitly. Uh, we're going to talk about repeated um, observations in a couple of lectures time, and we will come back to this um, and how you can model relationships between errors. So we're going to talk about growth models and things like that as well. Also, multi-level models handle missing data fairly well in general. There are, you know, some, some limits to that. But in general, if you have some missing observations, multi-level models um, will handle them reasonably well. Other things being equal. OK, let's look at an example. So this example is uh, about a rehabilitation program for zombies. So what we're looking at here is um, some zombies. This is if well, this example kind of comes from my uh, textbook, An Adventure in Statistics, where essentially there's an evil organization called Jigsaw who have uh, undergone some kind of, or they, they get people in and they put them through some genetic enhancement program that actually kind of turns them into zombies. So uh, this is looking at the end of the story is how to rehabilitate the zombies back into human form. But it's, essentially, it's a thinly veiled randomized control trial. So uh, we've got some variables in the data set. Um, first is 
a variable that tells us which of 10 clinics the zombies attended. So this is kind of our contextual variable or, or the thing that tells us about the hierarchical structure of the data. So 10 clinics and they're just named within this variable called ID clin. We've got another variable that represents the zombies ID, participant ID in the study. So that tells us uh, the individual from which any scores came from. Now we've got an intervention. So zombies have been randomized to two arms. So one of the arms is kind of a weightless control arm of the trial and the other one is a gene therapy, genetic therapy that we hope is going to reinstate them back to humanoid form. Well, I guess they are humanoid, back to human form, non-zombie. Uh, we've, we've also got some other variables that we think might be worth measuring. So um, we've basically got something called JEP level or genetic enhancement program level. So this was whether they went through a kind of a low or high genetic enhancement in the first place. Now the reason for including this is we would expect those who had a high genetic enhancement to be more zombified. So their kind of baseline state might be worse than those who went through a low genetic enhancement program. This is essentially, you can think of this as like a symptom severity score. So kind of how zombified are they in the first place? We've got uh, something which represents the time since they went through the enhancement program. So this is like a symptom duration, if you like. So how long is it since they were uh, evilly transformed into zombies? Um, and finally, our outcome is a resemblance score. So this is a, a score, uh, there's some kind of very sophisticated computer algorithm that uh, looks at their face, takes a photo of their face and matches it to a photo of them in their pre-zombified state and gives you a score of like the match. So if it's a kind of roughly 100% match, then what you're saying is their face has been returned identically to its pre-zombified state. 0% uh, percent means they are basically completely unrecognizable from their pre-zombified state. So obviously what we're hoping is after our intervention, we are getting higher resemblance scores. So they more resemble uh, what they look like before uh, being turned into zombies. Now earlier on I mentioned the phrase fixed and random coefficients. And that probably didn't make much sense. And it's probably not gonna make any sense when I've tried to explain it either, but we'll give it a go. Also a couple of slides ago, I talked about modeling the variation in intercepts and slopes. And I let that hang there for a while, tantalizing you with an explanation that was to come. And that time has come now. So what we've got is a situation where we've got zombies in an intervention program and they're treated at one of 10 clinics. So clinic is the context here or the contextual variable. Now, if we were to run uh, a sort of a general linear model like the ones we've looked at all through this module so far, um, basically, what we would get out of that, that is some parameter estimates. Now remember that we're always trying to uh, estimate the values of model parameters by using our sample data. So we get a load of parameter estimates. And remember these usually have a, have a uh, denoted by B. So these are the betas that I'm talking about here. So we've estimated the parameters of the model, the betas. And in this situation, we are assuming that these betas are fixed. So they just take on a single value. And in doing so, what we're basically assuming is that those betas are the same across the different contexts. They're the same across the different clinics. So they do not vary. Now, that's not the only way you can conceptualize parameter estimates or betas. You can also conceptualize them as what are known as random coefficients. And randoms are kind of it's not the best term for it, really, because people tend to think of random as meaning sort of arbitrary or made up or something. And that's not what it means. It just means that they are free to vary. So when you see random coefficients, it sort of means coefficients that are free to vary rather than being fixed. So if we fit a model where we allow our betas to vary or we have them as random coefficients, then essentially what we're doing is fitting a model where we are not assuming that the betas are the same across the different clinics, across the different contexts. We are instead entertaining the possibility that they vary across contexts. And more than that, we're actually going to estimate the degree to which they do vary across those contexts. So we're actually going to include in our model some terms that allow us to see whether the betas vary across the contexts. So to be specific about this, 
if we look at our intervention effect, this will have a beta attached to it. There will be a beta that represents the effect of the intervention. What we can do is we can model whether that beta varies across different contexts. And in doing so, what we're effectively asking is, is the effectiveness of the intervention variable across the different clinics? And when we fit an ordinary least squared regression or a linear model, we're not doing that. We're making the assumption that the treatment effect in this case is the same, is identical across the different clinics, which arguably is an unrealistic assumption. Hello, welcome to Milton's Secrets. And today, I'd like to share with you a secret about my owner. Now, he would like you to believe that he is like super clever and never makes any mistakes, especially not about statistics. However, I have a little secret to share. Assumptions like, are there like massive, uh, massively of oh, f me. The process of fitting a general. We've talked. Oh, f Just do that. Next. In repeated measures designs, we're assuming. Oh, you know what? I've f***ed that up totally. In intercepts and slopes across different contexts or different, uh, you know. Um, This slide is cursed. It's cursed, I tell you. Through all the other lectures on this module, then we would treat those. Oh my actual! I literally cannot get through this slide. It's a joke. Just don't tell him I told you, or he might not give me any treats. Milton really likes treats. Oh yeah, I love treats. Bye. So let's look at this a bit more concretely. So here's our data. Oh, actually, sorry, this is not our data. These are two uh, hypothetical uh, versions of our data. And um, on the right hand side of the screen, we are fitting a model which is allowing the intercepts of the model, the beta zeros in the model, to be random or variable. And on the right hand side, we are also, in addition to allowing the intercepts to be variable, we are allowing the slopes, so this is uh, kind of like the treatment effect really, to be variable across clinics as well. So what we're kind of doing, when we fit an ordinary least squared regression, what we effectively do is we fit a single line. I'm going to draw it on, say it's this red line. So we fit a single line and we are saying that that line applies to all clinics. So that line will have a beta zero. Which in this case is going to be the uh, average resemblance score in the weightless condition. And it also has a beta one or a beta attached to the intervention effect. So that tells us about the difference between the gene therapy group and the waitlist group. So when we estimate those, when we fit the model and we estimate those two things, what we're saying is those values apply to all the different clinics. And what these two diagrams are, are kind of showing or illustrating is that actually the effects might vary across the clinics. So on the left hand side, as I said, we've got a situation where we are modeling random intercepts or we're letting intercepts vary by clinic or by context. So remember the, the clinic is the context here. So what you can see is if we just fitted our ordinary model where there's a single value of beta zero, that does not really represent what's going on here because actually in the different clinics, we get different beta zeros. Each one of these clinics has a beta zero that is slightly different to the other clinics. So the beta zeros across the clinics are actually slightly different from each other. So if we take this as our kind of you know, data level effect when we ignore context, what you can hopefully see is there is variance. There are some intercepts or some clinics that have intercepts that are larger than that single value and some that have intercepts that are smaller. 
in magnitude than that value. So there is variability in the intercepts, and that is exactly what we model. We, we, get, we put a term in our model that represents the variability of those intercepts across the clinics. So if that term ends up being zero, what that means is that the intercepts do not vary at all across the clinics. In other words, the assumption of, a, of sort of fixed effects is um, com completely true. Um, so that's random intercepts. Because the other thing to notice on the left-hand side is that this, the actual treatment effect, the, the kind of angle of the lines, is the same across the clinics. So this is a situation where the treatment has an identical effect across the clinics, and that effect is the same as the overall effect, the line, uh, the line here I've put down the middle. So what we're saying here is that slopes, or the treatment effect, the, the, the slope within clinic is kind of the same for every clinic. It doesn't vary very much. So if we fit a model where we assume random intercepts, but we don't, um, sorry, where we model random intercepts, but we don't model random slopes, the left-hand side is what we are effectively saying. We're saying that overall kind of baseline levels of resemblance scores will vary across clinics, but the actual treatment effect itself will be consistent across clinics. Now compare that to over here on the right, where we not only model random intercepts we not only allow the intercepts to vary we also allow the slopes to vary now hopefully again what you can see is for each clinic there is variability in the intercepts so if you look at there's the sort of beta zero within each clinic it's a, a different position so all those starting points for the clinics are at different heights and let's say we again fitted an overall model here just like we did on the other side and very approximately that's going to be our treatment effect that's going to be what beta 1 represents if we fit a model where we have random slopes as well then we are not only allowing the intercepts to be variable across clinics we're allowing the treatment effect as well we're allowing the slope to also be variable. And the data on the right hand side is an example of where you know, that's a reasonable assumption because you can see, for example, this clinic here, right down the bottom, the treatment effect is negative. So uh, those that have gene therapy in this clinic, their resemblance scores actually go down. They start looking less like uh, their pre-zombified state. So it's actually having a negative impact. Um, for most of the clinics, that's not the case, fortunately, but this is an, this is an example where the treatment's having a, a kind of an adverse effect. So something's going on in that clinic um, such that, I think that's clinic three, such that um, treatment's having an adverse effect. Contrast that with this clinic here where you're, you're getting a really, really strong treatment effect. So that I think is clinic four. and. Um, if you, if you look at those two extremes, you can hopefully see that the slopes of those lines are like really, really different. I mean, I've done it deliberately extremely. So you can see that those slopes are really, really different. So in one of the clinics, you're getting a really strong positive effect of treatment. In another clinic, you're actually getting a, a, a negative effect of treatment. For the clinics in between, you can hopefully see that the, the lines, the treatment effects for each clinic are at different angles. So they are variable. So again, we can model this by putting a term in the model that represents the variability of those slopes around this kind of group level slope. So the, the sort of overall slope for the, you know, the, the whole data, we, we can model how variable slopes are across individual clinics. So it's like a single term that's like represents the variability in slopes. So essentially that's what we're doing. When we fit a multi-level model, we're extending the linear model to add terms that represent the variability in intercepts across different contexts and potentially variability in slopes or, or in this case treatment effects across different contexts. So that's kind of that's the essence of what we're doing. The process of fitting a multi-level model is pretty similar to any other model really. So you do some initial checks, plot your data, check that vaguely looks like there might be a linear relationship that you're modeling in the first place look for like really unusual cases so do scatter plots things like that if there is a kind of obvious lack of linearity it is sometimes appropriate to try and transform your uh kind of transform the variable so that the relationship becomes linear 
Um, having done those initial checks, uh, it's often a good idea to center your predictors. So that is to uh, basically subtract the mean from them. So they will have a mean of zero. Uh, we don't really talk a lot about that uh, on the rest of the module for kind of general, the general linear model, but in multi-level models, it can be quite helpful to do centering. Um, then you'll fit your sort of basic model where you've got fixed coefficients. And then it can, I mean, you don't always do this. Sometimes you just fit the model you want to fit, but it can be a useful thing to build up the model sort of sequentially. So you'd fit a sort of kind of basic intercept only model. So you're just predicting the outcome from uh, the intercept. Then you introduce a term that models the variability in those intercepts across contexts and see if that sort of improves the fit of the model. And then potentially, if it's theoretically interesting, you allow the the slopes or the effects to uh, vary across contexts as well. And then you, you know, add in predictors and so on and so forth. So you kind of build up the model sequentially, or you can do that uh, until you've got your final model. So in our example, we've got two level hierarchy. So we just have 190 zombies. They're at the bottom of the hierarchy, so we're at level one. And then they all sit within clinic. So some zombies had their treatments or were in the wait list for uh, clinic one, others it was clinic two and so on and so forth up to clinic 10. So the clinics are the context here that we're, so we're interested in whether the effects vary across clinics. Here's the actual data. And um, just to remind you, uh, so we've got our sort of main predictor or the predictor that for the experimental effect is whether the zombie was on in the waitlist arm or the gene therapy arm. So essentially we've got a sort of categorical predictor with two categories and that's going to be dummy coded with a zero and a one and we've done it in such a way that the waitlist is coded as zero. So the waitlist is like our baseline and a one is our gene therapy condition. So what this means is that the intercept, the beta zero represents uh, essentially the, the resemblance scores in the wait list control. So the first thing to note from the raw data, so the different lines represent the effects in different clinics and different colored dots represent the effects in different clinics. The main thing to focus on is the lines though. So first of all, if we look at the intercepts, so that's the, the value of resemblance in the wait list, if we look across clinics, you can see there is variability. So if we take this clinic right down the bottom, their beta zero is, uh, well, it's getting on for 35, rough, very roughly. And let's take a, a clinic at the other extreme. We've got a clinic up here where the resemblance score in the wait list is 60. So it's kind of twice as much, more or less. So there is variability. You can see if we look at the starting points of all these lines, there is variability in intercepts. So the resemblance scores in the wait list groups seems to vary across clinics. So we would want to model this with a random coefficient for uh, the intercept. What about the slopes or the treatment effect? Now the treatment e effect is represented by the lines and in particular how steep the lines are. So the angle at which the lines uh, are um, slanted. So uh, again, hopefully what you should be able to see is the lines are at different angles okay so uh, if we look at this clinic down here there's actually a negative slope so it looks like treatments uh, making in this treatment in this clinic actually makes zombies worse i mean i don't know what they're doing but there seems to be making them worse so there's that actually like a down slope there whereas if we again at the opposite extreme take this clinic up here there's a fairly strong effect of treatment so it's a very sort of positive slope and for the other clinics in between, you can hopefully see there's sort of a hodgepodge of different angled lines. And the fact that the lines are at different angles means the treatment effect is variable across the clinic. So again, we would probably want to model that. So drawing a plot like this, uh, where, we're, where you're looking at kind of the effects of interest across the different contexts, in this case, the different clinics, can be useful just to get a feel for do the intercepts and slopes appear to be variable across the different contexts. So what do these models look like in terms of the actual kind of equations? We're going to start off with the, the model we've been using all term. So this is where we assume fixed intercepts and slopes. So we assume that uh, intercepts and slopes cannot vary across different contexts. So we've seen this loads of times, and this is just to kind of familiarize yourself with the basic model that we're fitting. We're trying to predict resemblance scores. So this is the facial resemblance after treatment. 
we're predicting it from B to zero, and this is gonna be the resemblance score in the waitlist group. And we've got a predictor of intervention, so this is a dummy variable of zeros and ones, where zero is the waitlist, one is the, the, the gene therapy group. And we've got a parameter estimate attached to that, which is gonna tell us essentially uh, about the effect of intervention. So in this case, it's specifically what the, what the difference in mean resemblance scores is between the um, waitlist and treatment group. So this is our, this beta one quantifies the experimental effect, oh sorry, the treatment effect. And we also know there's gonna be some error in prediction. Now, the other thing to draw your attention to is these eyes, so these subscript eyes. So this is saying the resemblance score in you know, zombie eye is predicted from the intervention group that zombie eye was in, and there's going to be some error attached to our prediction for zombie eye. So all of those subscripts are kind of you know, at, the, at the zombie level, if you like. Now, when we start trying to model random intercepts and slopes, something happens to those subscripts. So the model gets slightly more complicated in the sense that we're now acknowledging the fact here that resemblance scores are attached to an individual I, an individual zombie, but also we have now a J there and the J represents the context. So this is like saying the resemblance score in zombie I within clinic J, so whatever clinic that zombie was in, is predicted from the intervention group that they were, that that zombie was in within clinic J and the error attached to that prediction is within zombie I within clinic J, whatever you know, clinic that zombie was in. So we have an extra subscript to represent the hierarchical structure of the data. Now notice the beta one doesn't change, we've got a kind of overall uh, effect of the intervention, but when we fit a random intercept model, we get a slightly more complicated intercept. So if you compare these two, You've got beta zero in the uh, general linear model version and underneath in the random intercept version that becomes B O J or B zero J. So that is what that represents is the intercept in clinic J. And what that term is made up of is we're told underneath. So here we're told what B O J actually represents or B zero J. So it's the overall effect. So the overall intercept for like all clinics lumped together, plus this new term, which represents the variability in those intercepts across clinics. So that UJ is like the variability, uh, or you know, the, the, the sort of difference in the intercept for clinic J relative to the intercept for all clinics lumped together. So what we're effectively doing when we add a random intercept is we're adding an extra term. So this term here gets added to the model. It's a term that models the variability in intercepts around the overall intercept. Now what happens when we add a random slope? So when we allow slopes to vary by context as well. Now, first thing, it doesn't make much sense to fit a random slope without a random intercept. So generally, uh, like the two go together. If you fitted a random intercept, you can then go on and fit a random slope. You wouldn't just plow straight in with a random slope, or it, uh, it's difficult to think of a situation where that would make much sense. So when we've got a random intercept and a random slope, well, resemblance is the same as it was before, so we're just acknowledging it's within zombie I within clinic J, so these I, J subscripts remain. And we've got our random intercept, beta zero J, which is defined down here as it was above. So all this is kind of the same as it is in the model above. What changes is now, the beta attached to the treatment effect also gets a J subscript. So we're now saying that the treatment effect can vary across context, across, so it's like the treatment effect for clinic J. And again, this is defined below as two different things. One is the overall treatment effect, so the treatment effect across all clinics. And again, we've added this term here, this U, which represents the variability in treatment effects across the different clinics. So it's like how, uh, what's the difference between the treatment effects in clinic J relative to the uh, treatment effect for all clinics. So 
that's what the equations look like. I just want to quickly draw your attention to the fact. So this slide is, is, is identical to the previous slide. It's absolutely identical apart from one important thing, which is all the Bs have been replaced by the Greek letter gamma. And that is because when you read stuff on multi-level models, gamma is typically used instead of B. And I just want to draw your attention to that because uh, it can be very confusing. But when you see a gamma, just think of it as a B. It's a different symbol, but it represents the same thing. So all the stuff you've learned about Bs over the course of these lectures applies to gammas. It's just, you know, they look different, but in all other respects, just treat them as exactly the same. So what about when we want to add predictors? So let's say we want to add the GEP level. So this was, uh, it tells us the original enhancement program that the zombie went through. So whether they went through a sort of low or high intensity program. Like I said, this is a bit like symptom severity. So how zombified are they likely to be in the first place? So the model is the same as the, the last model on the previous slide. So we're predicting resemblance in an individual zombie in clinic J. We've got a random intercept that's defined down here. We've got the random slope or the random treatment effect that's defined here. Everything is exactly the same as before, but we add in this new predictor of GEP level. But notice, that that doesn't have a J subscript. So we're not modeling that as a random coefficient. We're just saying that's a fixed effect. That shouldn't, assuming everyone's been kind of randomized to their clinics, you wouldn't expect uh, the original enhancement, the low or high intensity to, to be variable across the different clinics if the randomization was successful. So we don't need this effect to vary across clinic and it doesn't make sense for it to vary across clinic particularly. So we don't need to uh, have a J subscript for that. We don't need to add in other U parameters to model the variability in that effect across the different clinics. And the same with if we're adding the, the, sort of the uh, symptom duration, if you like, so the time since they had their original uh, kind of transformation. Model stays exactly the same. So you compare it to the one above, it's exactly the same apart from we've added in the predictor and again, We've added it in as a fixed effect. There's no J subscript because again, if the randomization has been successful, then symptom severity should basically be the same across the different clinics. So we can model these. We can make the model more complex and uh, you know put these in as, as random coefficients as well, but we're just not going to here. So this is the model we're fitting, this final model. So how do we uh, assess the fit and how do we compare the models? If we're going to build them up sequentially, which like I said, you don't have to, but can be a good idea. Then basically we start off with fixed coefficients and then we gradually change that one aspect of the model and then see whether the fit of the model improves. And we can assess that either with the AIC or BIC. Uh, there's also a, a minus two log likelihood statistic that tells us whether the, the kind of the change has been, changing fit is significant. So let's have a look at how we translate these models into R code. So we use, um, well, there's two different packages you can use. One is NLME and the other is LME4. For this lecture, I use NLME. Uh, and we start off, first of all, we just want to fit a model that has no predictors and it just has a fixed intercept. So that's the model that we are fitting here. So resemblance scores are being predicted from a fixed intercept. Basically, they're being predicted from the mean uh, and uh, you know, that's it, and some error in prediction. So to fit this model, what we do is we fit, uh, so like I said, we use NLME and we use the GLS function, and essentially this is a bit like LM, so we just specify a formula and specify the data. So the formula is we're predicting resemblance scores from, and the one just represents the intercept. So we're just saying pre pre uh, predict resemblance scores from the intercept and we specify the method, this is quite important, as being maximum likelihood, because by default, it will be a restricted maximum likelihood. We need it to be maximum likelihood so that we can compare the models, basically. So that's our baseline. We're then gonna build this up to allow those intercepts to vary. So this is like the, uh, this is the random intercept model, essentially. So again, compare the equations so, and how they are different. 
So down here, we've now got the IJ subscripts because we're allowing things to vary by clinic or by context. Other than that, the two equations are the same apart from we've added this term. So we've added one term to the model, which is a term that estimates the variability of intercepts across contexts. And the way we add that in in the R code, again, the R code is exactly the same. The only difference is we now use the LME function instead of the GLS function. And that allows us to specify this highlighted line. And that's allowing us to specify a random effect. And we specify that as, again, we use a one to represent the intercept. So we're saying allow the intercept to vary across the variable ID clin. And ID clin is a variable that represents the different clinics. So what we're doing by adding that line of code is saying allow intercepts to vary across the variable ID clin. So allow it to vary across clinics. So now we've got a random intercept model. Let's add a predictor. So again, compare everything to the model on the previous slide. What we've added in now is this section. So we've added in the predictor intervention and we've given it, a, to begin with, a fixed effect. So we're just giving it a single uh, gamma in this case, a single, we're gonna have a single parameter estimate. And to add that in, again, I've highlighted the line of code that changes. And whereas before we had resemblance predicted but from one predicted from the intercept, we now have it predicted from intervention. So we've added intervention as a predictor. Look at the rest of the code, it's exactly the same as the previous model. So we still have that random intercept in there. Now model four, we're now going to allow uh, the treatment effect to vary across contexts. So again, compare to the previous, to the other equation on the slide, the thing that we have added in is this. We've added in the term that represents the variability in treatment effects. And we do that again with the, in the highlighted bit of code. So note up here, when we've just got a random slope, we've got one varying across ID clin. Whereas down here, we now have the variable intervention varying across ID clin. So that bit of code there changes from uh, having a, a, a random intercept model to now having a random slope model for the, variable, for the predictor intervention. Now, if we want to add in GEP level, um, again, model's the same as the last one on the previous slide, except we've now added in this. So we add in GEP level as a predictor, and it's got a fixed effect. So we don't need to change, we don't need to change this line that specifies the random part of the model. But we do change the formula. So now we have resemblance predicted not only from intervention but also from GEP level. So the only thing that's changed is we've added GEP level as a predictor. And the final model is going to look like this. Again, compare it to the one above. The only difference is here <clears throat> where we've added um, the time since they had their genetic enhancement. And again, that's a fixed effect. So we've left the random part of the model alone in the R code, but we've changed the formula. So we're now predicting resemblance from intervention and GEP level and TSE months. So when we created each of those models, we saved them and we can compare them using the ANOVA function. So we just put all the models as a as comma separated list into the ANOVA function and we get a table like this one. So here we have model one, two, three, right through to six. They correspond to the, you know, the, the models that I just described. So we start off with model one, which just predicts resemblance from uh, <clears throat> the overall intercept. And then model one gets compared to model two. It's a significant change. So by uh, adding the random slope component, we got significant change. Adding intervention as a predictor, significant change. So it looks like intervention is a significant predictor of resemblance. Allowing the uh, treatment effect, the intervention effect to vary across contexts, created a significant um, improvement in the model. So it looks like if treatment effects are significantly variable across the 10 clinics, adding the GEP level doesn't significantly improve the fit of the model, but adding in the time since they were enhanced again does. 
So anyway, you can just, you know, if you do it sequentially, if you build up your model sequentially, you can use this function to compare uh, each model. But you do have to be a bit careful. The models have to be kind of hierarchically based. So we built them up like a term at a time and every model was the same as the previous model. We were just adding something new. And ideally you want to add, you know, just one thing new so that you know that the, the thing you've added is the thing that's having the effect. So let's look at the model parameters. So we can look at the model parameters of the fixed effects, first of all. So we've got three fixed effects. One is the effect of the intervention condition. The other is the GEP level. The other is TSE months. And if we look at these fixed effects, then basically we can see that we've got parameter estimate for them to begin with. And also, we've got significance values, we've got test statistics, all the usual stuff, exactly the same as in a normal linear model. So what we can sort of ascertain from this is the overall, so the overall gene therapy effect when we sort of ignore the context and we just look at the effect kind of overall, uh, that was a significant effect and the estimate's about 6.8. Um, so that's kind of giving you an idea of the overall difference in resemblance scores. If we look at GEP level, that's also a significant predictor, and so is TSE months, and they're both negative. So that kind of suggests that, like, uh, the more zombified they were to begin with, and the longer ago their treatment, uh, sorry, their zombification was, the worse treatment outcomes were. So, uh, which is what you would expect, really. It's in the direction you would expect. What about the random effects? Well, in terms of random effects, we don't get significance tests of these, although if you know we had them from building up the model sequentially, but we, we do get estimates of what they are. So in particular, we can look at the standard deviation of the intercept and the standard deviation of the treatment effect. And yeah, they're actually quite big. You've got to look at them within the context of you know, the original variables of measurement and so on and so forth but essentially standard deviation of intercepts is four and a half more or less and the standard deviation of the treatment effect so of the uh, kind of the gammas attached to each clinic it's over eight which again like is when you think about the size of the gamma to begin the overall gamma that's pretty big so you're looking at the size of the standard deviation relative to the size of the original gamma as with other models, we can look at residuals. So to uh, to look at you know whether the assumptions of the model seem to be met. And in this case, we have some quite peculiar stuff going on. So first of all, we've got a massive outlier here. So that's a standardized residual close to six, which is absolutely huge. Uh, but taking that you know taking that out of the equation for the rest we do look like we've got a relatively even spread of uh, residuals around the, the different fitted values. So it doesn't look like there's heteroscedasticity as such, apart from this kind of really, really extreme case. And if we look at the um, distribution of residuals, uh, it looks, again, fairly normal, apart from we have this kind of one very, very extreme case. It does look like there might be an extreme case in the data. It is also possible to get a robust uh, version of the model uh, with some caveats to this. So the robust models like really take a long time to estimate and they don't always estimate very well. So it's not like the, uh, the panacea you might imagine. You also don't get significance tests attached to them. So if that's the sort of thing that's gonna bother you, then um, that's a limitation or whatever. But what you do get is robust estimates of the parameters. So, we can have a look at these and compare them to the ones that we got in the you know, the non or the standard model and uh, kind of see what's what. We can also get uh, the random effects out of the robust models and again compare them. So um, again for the intercepts it's about four and a half which I think is pretty similar to what it was before. The standard deviation for the treatment effect is actually slightly higher. I think that was eight point something before and it's now nearly 10. So uh, in this robust model, we're getting more variability or the estimate of variability of the treatment effect across clinics is larger. So to sum up, uh, data structures in the real world are quite often hierarchical and that hierarchical structure can be important. Um, and if we fit a, a sort of an ordinary 
general linear model, it's going to just ignore this hierarchy completely, which is uh, kind of a dangerous thing. But the hierarchical models that we've just talked about are basically just fancy linear models. So all the stuff you've learned about linear models, really, that's all information that you can apply in this new context. Where the models differ is we add in uh, terms explicitly to model the fact that intercepts and slopes on any particular slopes on any particular predictor can vary across context. So we're sort of adding in variance terms, if you like. We also change the method of estimation, so we don't use OLS estimation anymore. We use maximum likelihood, but you know, from a practical point of view, that needn't concern you. Finally, it can be a good idea to start off with a model that ignores the hierarchy and then build up slowly, sort of term by term. So you're just adding kind of one thing to the model at a time, and then um, you can apply some significance tests to see whether each step that you've applied has kind of significantly improved the fit of the model. That's particularly handy if you want to significance test the random effect. So if you want to know whether the variance in intercepts or the variance in slopes is in, or effect, treatment effects is in fact um, significant. Okay, that's all for today. See you soon. Bye.